So very good morning to you and you're welcome to today's signpost webinar. Um, well, it's the scheme we have all been talking about for some time now and following the approval of Ireland's CAP strategic plan uh, this week, the green light has been given to the new Acres Agri-Environmental Scheme. So what does it, the new scheme look like and what are the opportunities for farmers? And to explain this new scheme and to answer your questions, I'm delighted to be joined uh, this morning by John Muldowney, who is head of the Agricultural and Environmental Structures Division in the Department of Agriculture, Food and the Marine, uh, a colleague of John's, Mark Crosby, uh, Assistant Principal Officer, and Pat Morrison, who's an Agricultural Inspector, also with the Department of Agriculture, uh, Food and the Marine. And we are joined by our own Catherine Keena, who's Countryside Management Specialist, uh, who's going to help us with uh, questions uh, a little later on. Uh, um, but John, maybe just if you could introduce yourself to us, and uh, you're going to give us a presentation on the new scheme. Um, you're 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 now leading that new uh, or a new, relatively new to that uh, uh, that new role. Um, you've been working very diligently on developing this new scheme for the last uh, number of years, I guess. Right, Mark, and thanks for the introduction. Yeah, so we've been busy at this over the last, I guess, the lead in, in the CAP strategic plan has probably been more than two years now at this stage. Obviously, the agri-environmental program, ACRES, as we're now calling it, replaces the old loss. It is a very significantly funded scheme in terms of the CAP. It's a pillar scheme in terms of what's there. And I guess we're it's more data-driven than ever before in terms of the data layers that we brought in from National Parks and Wildlife and EPA in terms of water quality. So we're trying to better ensure the right action in the right place in this scheme. And we hope that there's a good uptake with farmers in terms of, I guess, the scheme that we have to offer. Well, there's a lot of experience there, isn't there, from the, the REP scheme, the AOS and GLASS and REAP more recently. So, yeah, no, look, we're, we're, we're I think, a lot of interest in, in today's webinar. Um, Mark, you're based in Johnstown Castle and uh, responsible for a lot of the, the payments, I, 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 I believe, in, in relation to acres. Yeah, I, I'm on the admin side, financial and system issues. Um, I've been working on GLASS and I've worked on REAP and REAP was a great lead in project to Acres. Uh, we, we learned a lot from REAP and we've built in those findings into this new scheme. So um, yeah, so it's all interesting and a lot to offer. Great, and Pat, you're, you're working on the agricultural inspectorate side and based in Johnstown Castle, is that right? Yeah, Mark, so I've been involved in, in developing the specifications for the acre scheme over the last few months. So I'm glad to say that the, the final version of the specifications will be going up on the website this morning or sometime today. So we've been busy with that for the last while. Great. And Catherine, you've been working uh, very hard with advisors and, and specialists over the last few months now preparing for the opening of the scheme. Can you tell us a bit about what's happening there within Chagisk? Yeah, well, I suppose, and, and you've just mentioned there was a couple of initiatives that have led to this, like the, the results-based CIPs and the REAP scheme in particular is kind of getting us ready because there is a momentous change moving from uh, all action-based to some results-based payments. Um, so, but, you know, advisors are well capable of taking up the challenge. Um, they really took to REAP amazingly well and, you know, are superb people to be getting the message, the right message out to farmers. Thanks, Catherine. And so, look, today is, is going to be, John, you're going to give us a presentation about the, the scheme. Um, uh, we do anticipate uh, a lot of questions around, obviously, there's a huge interest in this new scheme, and we will do our best to try and get through as many of them as possible. Um, but there will be other opportunities for uh, particularly agricultural advisors uh, and consultants to, to have their questions addressed. Maybe we just mention that now, John, just in advance of, of the, the presentation. There, it, there is a, a session you're planning, I understand. Yeah, no, that's correct. So as Pat mentioned, we have the final version of the specifications that's ready to put on our, the website there today. There's a number of minor changes in that. So we're planning, and I'm assuming most uh, farm advisors have already received an email on it. So there's a webinar scheduled for Tuesday afternoon, uh, just to go through, I guess, the key changes that are there. And again, to highlight the, the terms and conditions have been also put up from Mark's side as well, in terms of, I guess, the key requirements, core requirements in the scheme, so that people can have a look at that as well, that backs up. Uh, the overall basis of presumably you'll have leaving lots of time for questions uh, during that session 
Um, great. Thanks. Thanks for that, John. So look, without further ado, I'm going to ask John if you could share your screen with us and, and we'll go through the presentation and to remind everybody that today's session is being recorded and it will be available uh, for uh, that you can look back at on the, our Chagas, the Chagas YouTube channel and also as a podcast on the, uh, the podcast platform that you use. It's, it's available on most of those platforms and John's presentation will be on the Chagas website also. Um, so please do send us your questions. You, we have the, the experts here this morning. So um, maybe I, 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 maybe if you could hold your questions, I think, until after John's presentation, because I imagine a lot of, of them will be probably headed off during the presentation. So, John, we'll ha ha hand over to you and uh, we will talk, you, talk to you afterwards. Yeah, thanks very much, Mark. So again, we've done our introductions already, so we'll just uh, dive into the presentation. Um, overall, I guess the key question is, what is ACRES? ACRES is the Agri-Climate Rural Environment Scheme. It's a flagship scheme within the CAP strategic plan worth 1.5 billion. It replaces the old uh, green low carbon agri-environmental scheme that was there running since 2014 to 2022. And overall, th this new scheme is building on the learnings from GLOSS. Previous agri-environmental schemes like REPS and AOS as well, the results-based agri-environmental pilot called REAP and the EIP projects that are out there. Um, as I mentioned, uh, the funding is 1.5 billion. It's bigger than any ever funding for the agri-environmental previously, and it's to cover the period 2023 to 2027. So there's funding there for about 50,000 participants to join in the scheme. Um, the scheme then is uh, split into two areas, which I'll go into Acres General, where we have a target of 30,000 participants that will have an average payment of 5,000 up to a max of 7.3. And the Acres Cooperative, which again, I'll go into more detail later on, a target of 20,000 participants across eight zones with a max payment of 10,500 and an average of seven. So, how does Acre differ from Glass? Well, I guess. Principally, it's the structure that's there. While it's still one scheme, there's two individual streams in it. The Acres Cooperative is basically it's eight zones, mainly down in the Western Seaboard. I have a map of that to show you. And it's basically been these zones being identified on the basis of certain environmental criteria, such as high status water sites, uh, the Natura 2000 network across the country for biodiversity, SPAs for the protection of birds. Some of the bigger EIPs that we had, such as the Henna Harrier, the Pearl Mussel, uh, the Burn Scheme, they're all integrated into this in terms of taking the learnings from those results-based schemes that have been so successful over the last five to 10 years and trying to scale it up onto a bigger national scale. And then we have the Acres General Stream, which is more mirrors the gloss that was there previously, and I'll go into that, that's available for farmers that are outside of that. In terms of, I guess, another key difference is, like gloss, the majority of the actions that are in acres are prescription-based actions where payment is made for satisfactory completion of individual tasks, and a farmer can choose any number of tasks up to maxing out the payment at 7,300. But there's also then the introduction of these results-based actions where the payment rate is dependent on the score, the quality of the habitat. And I'll try to explain that in a little bit more detail later on. And the big advantage of results-based actions is that there's no prescription, hard and fast prescription. It's more flexible to what the farmer is doing, but basically you're paid in terms of the quality of the habitat that's up upon your farm. In terms of the acres general actions, uh, overall, there's 31 general actions available. Um, like GLOSS, they range between area-based actions, linear actions, unit-based actions. So area-based actions, we have 14 of those. They could be like low input um, grassland. This is the results-based action. Um, farmers have to identify grassland that has, I guess, a mix of non-rye grass species in terms of both grasses and then a broad range of indicator species in terms of broadleaf plants and there's a scoring system and depending on the score of one to ten you get a different payment rate then there's linear based actions such as the riparian buffer strip or the establishment of new hedges and then there's unit based actions such as tree planting where you're paid per individual tree that's planted on the farm and then the whole farm actions are ones where they don't apply to any specific action, 
area on the farm. So it's such actions as the low emission slurry spreading. So again, the low emission sp slurry spreading is to try and contribute to improved nitrogen management on the farm and to try and reduce ammonia emissions on the whole thing. So this is a map then in terms of these uh, cooperative zones. So there's eight of these zones across the country uh, from Donegal right down to Cork and Kerry. And there's even a zone in Leinster as well in terms of what's there. These zones were identified, as I say, on the basis of the high status water sites, the Natura 2000 maps and other high nature value indicators that are there. And these zones basically map out an area that we anticipate maybe 20,000 farmers will, will have access to. There's CP, there's what's called CP management teams that are put into this to try and assist both farmers and advisors uh, better target the delivery of actions to ensure conservation targets are achieved in these areas. Uh, the CP teams, there was a tender earlier on in the year and five teams were successful in this tender and they've, be, they've basically been in place since uh, late April this year, doing work in these areas to try and identify the core conservation objectives for this, to try and better deliver, I guess, public good outcomes in terms of water quality, biodiversity, and climate action. And they'll be trying to, I guess, bring those level of conservation objectives right down to farm and field level in terms of what's needed. Um, but the principal point of access for a farmer is still via your local farm advisor is the first point of contact on any of this. So I guess the next question uh, farmers might be asking is, how can I find out which acres is for, for me? Well, there's three options there in terms of which acres is for you in terms of uh, the general scheme or the cooperative stream access. So you can log on to your own ag food account and go to acres access agreement and you'll be able to see which area you're in. You could also send a text message to DAF makers followed by your herd identifier, and that will give you respond back to you then to say which, um, whether you're in the cooperative or general stream, or you can contact your farm advisor and they'll log on to Ag Food and they'll see under the acres EOI tab which area you're eligible for. So there are the three points of contact. So again, it's directing it back through the farm advisors able to advise which stream a farmer should be entering into on this. And you don't have a choice. If you're in the acres co-op, you have to participate through that stream, but it's your farm advisor will lead on that piece of work first and foremost. Uh, the core requirements of acres, again, similar to the loss, you have to have an approved acres advisor who will prepare a farm sustainability plan. And participants in the acres cooperation approach must also engage with cooperation teams. But the first protocol is their farm advisor to, I guess, get the principal application in place. And then further elements of that will be added on over time in terms of lands to be scored and the availability of other what's called non-productive investments and landscape actions. And again, I'll go into those later on. Then there's a mandatory training that must be completed by the end of the first year. And the acres CP area will also have additional modules to be delivered through the CP teams in terms of specific conservation objectives that are there and trying to better inform farmers in terms of what's required in those areas. And then lastly, there's the key requirement of record keeping to have the evidence trail that actions are completed and put in place. In terms of the structure then of Acres General, we'll go through this first. Again, similar to GLOSS, there's a tiered entry system uh, where tier one has priority access over tier two, which in turn has priority access over tier three. In terms of the priority environmental areas that are in tier one, again, like previously, these include commonage areas, Natura 2000 sites, geese and swan maps. And there's a number of these priority mapped areas where if, if these are mapped out on your farm and you select the appropriate action associated with those, then you're in that tier one category and farm advisors will be able to direct on advice in relation to that. Then there's tier two, where you, you might necessarily have these priority environmental areas on your holding, but tier two covers farmers that wish to do a higher level of environmental engagement, such as engaging on, I guess, tree planting is a core action, or if they have engaged in the native woodland element of uh, the national forestry scheme, that would get you into tier two access. Additionally, if you're in what's called vulnerable water areas, 
where on the water framework directive, they have identified priority areas of action, and we've mapped off a portion of these to be very vulnerable because you have agricultural pressures in the priority areas of action. So it's trying to address those issues. And again, if you select appropriate action, you'll activate that tier two level. And lastly, within tier two, then it's for the more, I guess, progressive farmers, farms that are typically at a more moderate to higher stocking rate than others or have uh, more than 30 hectares of arable land under holding. If they take on a list of uh, shortlisted actions, again, they can activate that tier two status. And after that, then it's a free for all in terms of the general actions that are there. So intake into uh, acres will be via a phase basis via tranches subject to DAFM and advisor capacity. And currently tranche one is open. Farm advisors are able to be working on this. The submit button for plans isn't available yet, but the system is open and advisors are able to be working on this system. Tranche two then will be open for a similar period this time next year. And there will be a possibility then of tranche three, depending on uptake levels that we have received. And those that are entering tranche one in terms of their applications now, they'll receive, if they're successful, they'll receive a start date of the 1st of January, 2023. And if we're oversubscribed, there'll be a ranking and selection process will apply as well. And again, that's outlined in more detail in the terms and conditions. Then moving on to the cooperation measure in terms of the structure of the action. So again, this varies from what the general scheme is. So principally payments in this area are made up of three types of payments. And I'll go into these in more detail later on. But firstly, you have the results-based payments. And typically we have a peatland scorecard, grassland scorecard, and a woodland scorecard. And you can, I suppose, achieve payments of up to 7,000 euros for the results-based element of your farm plan. And then after that, there's additional voluntary actions in terms of uh, landscape actions and non-productive investments that you can take on in those. And there's a number of examples there in terms of what these non-productive investments or landscape actions are trying to do. So the non-productive investments are more individual and farmer-led. Advisors will be able to do the application for those, whereas the cooperation or landscape actions, while they're still individual farmer led, very often the cooperation team will be coordinating these across a larger landscape area, such as trying to manage fire prevention in a landscape basis or flood prevention measures in a landscape basis. In terms of the high level co-op team roles, uh, I guess there's a question out there in terms of what are the these CP roles, what are they doing that's different to farm advisors, given that you're still approaching the farm advisor first? Well, the co-op team roles, they're going to be in place on the ground. They're trying to model themselves on what the EIP groups would have done. So it's trying to facilitate that local bottom-up approach in terms of development of additional actions for uh, the area in terms of non-productive investments and landscape actions. So they'll develop local action plans that basically try and consolidate the conservation objectives for these zones in terms of the priorities that are there and try and better understand what are the, I suppose, the drivers of damage in the local area in terms of that might be undermining the conservation status of some of these. So they'll be working to develop these local action plans. They'll be liaising with farmers, national parks and wildlife, uh, the law pro um, officers in the area and other NGOs in terms of trying to better understand delivery of conservation objectives. <clears throat> You'll be trying to build capacity to engage locally with farmers and to support the, vision, the provision of public good landscape related to biodiversity, water quality and climate action. You know, trying to improve that level of information and how the various um, I guess bi biodiversity and water challenges are understood at farm and landscape level to try and deliver more outcome through individual farms. They'll improve the two-way communication and dissemination of local level conservation objectives between farmers and the policy makers. They'll be there to better support farmers deliver environmental goods in these sensitive landscapes. And they'll act as advocates of what farmers are doing to protect the environment with local communities and the importance of an active living farming community to deliver these conservation objectives. 
And additional to that, then they'll be trying to, to monitor and evaluate the quality of farm plans, the, I suppose, habitat scoring and Im improvements that will be happening over time, and overall outputs of what Acres Co-op can deliver in terms of quality outcome to try and ensure better value for money in terms of what Acres is providing, but also feeding into to uh, national reporting requirements for water quality and biodiversity reporting. So I guess moving on now, a key element that I have mentioned quite a number of times is results-based payments. And people might be wondering what this is about. So overall, this is payments for environmental quality so that two adjacent farms depend on the quality of the, I suppose, the habitat that's on the ground to get a different payment. And this is similar to the approach that you already see in farming circles in terms of you have, I suppose, your grid structure in terms of when farmers send animals to the factory and the higher the grading animal gets a higher payment per kilogram than the lower grading animal. And it's the same principle then when we go into this habitat quality. So the idea is it's a quality-based payment system for environmental uh, good. It's a scorecard based system looking at low input grasslands and low input peat grassland in terms of, I guess, I suppose the abundance of indicator species that highlight the, I suppose the habitat is in good quality and delivering for biodiversity or water quality. And the higher the score, the higher the payment. And you can see the payment scale there in terms of low input grassland. So depending on where you are within that, that's uh, the range that might be there. So the farmer earnings are determined by the environmental services or the market value or trying to put a better value on quality. And farmers can see then that they're not comparing that someone in Gloss might have been getting the same payment, but farmers might have been saying, but my grassland is better than yours. This is the opportunity to try and differentiate these. And it also provides that opportunity that no longer in, the, in this sort of approach is there a hard and fast prescription. It's more about the correct site selection and then the farmer continues to do what they're doing with advice from farm advisors and from the CP teams in terms of what will help to improve the score. But the farmer has the flexibility to farm according to local or individual needs in terms of what's in that area. So it allows that greater level of flexibility rather than the hard and fast prescriptions that would have been typical of previous schemes. So this is a huge innovation. It has been proven to be very successful in the REAP scheme and in, in the a number of EIPs that have utilized this approach. So this is why we're trying to scale up this. And overall, I would say the commission have been very, have very well received this approach in terms of what we're trying to achieve in acres because of this approach, that it is very ambitious in terms of what we're trying to do in this space. So like cattle and sheep, quality pay is. So you see the field here on the the left, it's a typical ryegrass field. There's no diversity in terms of what's there. So that would receive a lower score and a lower payment, whereas the one on the right, there's more diversity in both in terms of stru sward structure, but also in terms of the variation of species that are within that sward. So there's a higher payment for the, the right-hand side type field. So I guess overall then in terms of trying to deliver, there's a lot within, I guess, overall acres and trying to Bring farm advisors. So we provided farm, I guess, advisor training back in July and again in September in terms of the specifications of all the schemes. We'll be hoping to provide further results-based training in the field um, next spring or early summer. There's training videos for later, later playback as well available on the department website and guides in terms of suitable and unsuitable fields. And there's a species identification guide and booklet as well that's there to help support farm advisors to do this. And like, again, it's on the website. So farmers can also look at this to try and get a better understanding themselves of what this results-based scoring is all about and to try and better understand what it means and what they should be doing and how to engage. And the species identification booklet here is very useful as well in terms of to help I suppose, rebuild capacity in farm advisory and at farmers on the ground in terms of understanding the, I suppose, the range of biodiversity that's there in plant life under holdings. And if you get the biodiversity in plant life in terms of vegetation, right, you know, birds and other species will all come in and be able to live within that, birds and mammals in terms of optimizing that biodiversity right across the ecosystem. 
So moving on to Acres Cooperation, and I think it probably deserves a little bit of further explanation as well in terms of the detail that's there beyond, beyond the high level, I suppose, roles of the CP teams. So firstly, the complementarity with the general stream actions that are there. So overall, I guess we the department clearly acknowledges that some farmers will be in the CP stream because they have maybe a very small part of their holding within that. And because of that, they have to enter the CP stream. So the rule that we have built into the system, if you have three hectares or 20% of your holding, whichever is the smaller gains you access to that CP area with the higher payment ceilings that are in it. So it is beneficial to you. But if you only happen to have, you know, five or 10 hectares, you obviously don't have a large area you're holding to be scored using these results-based scorecards. So then you can use the balance of that funds to try and take on additional general actions. So it's only where there is a balance of, of from the core 7,000 unutilized that you can move on to selecting other actions to build it up. So if you want to take on actions that are on CP lands, you know, say you have a smallish holding and you don't, you have much space, the three actions that we've identified that are compatible without undermining the conservation objectives of CP areas are stone wall maintenance, uh, rare breeds and low emission slurry spreading in terms of those. So there, they are three that can be applied on the CP lands themselves. However, you also have the option again, if you're below that 7,000 ceiling to try and take on other general actions on land that's outside the CP area. So you might have a farm with 10 hectares inside the CP boundary and a further 10 hectares outside. Well, on the land outside, they're, they're free to select from the general actions on the non-CP lands. Um, I guess another element then is uh, commonage in acres. So primarily, more than 80% of the commonage in the country is covered in the cooperative areas. And it's a mandatory action for any farm with commonage that they have to participate in this action. So as I say, the majority is in the CP areas, but if you have commonage and you're a non-CP farmer, just in the general scheme, you still have to mandatorily uh, engage in the commonage management. Um, overall, what this means is that, again, the CP teams will be providing a results-based scoring, again, free of charge to farmers. So this will be done on a coordinated basis across all the commonages that the CP teams will do this. So they'll do the scoring of that. Um, if you're outside the CP areas, commonage is, of course, uh, tier one access. So again, that helps you to get in and there are the minimum requirements there in terms of 0.5 of a hectare declared in 2021 and that you continue to farm this in 2022 and beyond. There's a minimum stocking rate then to be taken off the old uh, commonage management plans that are there in gloss and they'll be reviewed as a result of the results-based scoring. The minimum stocking rates will be reviewed over time then in terms of what's optimum to manage the conservation objectives of the commonage. And overall, the principle in the agreement that is that for participants in acres, they're not to hinder or block works that are agreed between the CP teams and the other common shareholders in terms of what's there. So everyone is to engage in the process of this, but no one person can block what the majority are trying to do for the benefit of trying to maintain, I suppose, the conservation objectives. And overall, it's the land eligibility, that eligible hectare on the common edge. And in the CP zones, additional actions will be available as well in these areas to aid habitat re restoration. So if the scorecard is identifying specific threats or pressures on the commonage, there will be associated non-productive investments or landscape actions to try and help deliver recovery in the commonage areas. So you've heard me say these words of non-productive investments and landscape actions a lot. So these are specific for the CP areas in terms of, I suppose, the work that they're doing. So as I said, they're developing local action plans. Primarily, they're delivering the results-based scoring system in terms of the scorecards that will be completed by farm advisors and maybe some bespoke scorecards as well if there's some specific issues. Um, you know, like corn creek, I believe it needs a separate scorecard to what uh, the three core ones that we have. So it'll be a little bit of that. But the CP teams then, they'll be developing these non-productive investments in landscape actions to try and address 
the threats and pressures that have been identified in the scorecarding system and that have been developed in terms of in coordination collaboration with with farmers on the ground in terms of these local areas in terms of the mpis there's probably going to be a list at present of about 50 different mpis so again in acres general we have 31 actions so this will be additional 50 actions that will be there in the cp areas they'll probably vary by cp zone in terms of what's applicable and probably from farm to farm in terms of what's applicable, depending on the specific conservation objective. The advisor will be able to apply for these non-productive investments through the DLAMS, so basically through the farm sustainability planning window, and there'll be an application window each year from 2023 onwards. And the MPIs are basically they're an annual action that you have to add on to your acres plan. And that can vary then from year to year in terms of what's there. Because these sites are very sensitive, the CP teams will screen the proposed MPIs and produce a work plan, works plan to try and ensure that the MPIs don't undermine those conservation objectives. And the CP teams will provide approval for the authorized actions, which will be, have a time limited period for further delivery. Uh, the, low, the landscape actions, LAs, will be also delivered locally again by the pro project officer and local farmers based on those local objectives again to deliver for conservation. At the moment, the CP teams are looking maybe at 10 to 12 standard landscape actions, which are basically a pool, a suite of the non-productive investments. So you could see, you know, seven to 10 non-productive investments would be, I suppose, grouped together to provide a landscape based action, which the CP teams would try and help the delivery of these actions or the siting of, of them on a landscape basis across multiple farms while individual farmers would be doing individual elements of that and again applications for these can be throughout the year and the, the applications for these landscape actions will be coordinated through the cp teams themselves and the cp teams will screen the actions and the actions can be updated annually as well and between the non-productive investments and landscape actions there's a budget of three and a half thousand that's available for these per farmer per year on these then local area partnerships as i say the cp teams are trying to i guess develop the principles that were there with the eip in terms of that bottom-up approach so there'll be local area partnerships developed to try and learn from i guess the local farmers mpws rangers law pro officers and trying in terms of trying to ensure the delivery of these conservation objectives and that everyone is working together in terms of, I suppose, that it's not all just but top down of policy saying you must do this, but it's trying to get that balance of what, what the local areas feel is important to deliver for the conservation outcomes. Uh, these partnerships will also help to de develop the, I suppose, the training priorities that are within the individual zones. And again, you can imagine some of the zones are quite big, so the the training needs could vary from one end of the zone to the other. Uh, advisors and farmers will be involved in the delivery of these training events and they'll be paid for by, by the project team to engage in this type of work. And farmers and advisors will be rotated annually as well to try and ensure the maximum number of people get the opportunity to participate in these partnerships and engagement to try and, I suppose, broaden the capacity as well of people, what you understand in terms of, you know, again, it's what is meant by SACs, SPAs, high water staffs, and what needs to be done within these areas. I suppose coming down then to the all important point for farmers payments, the Department of Agriculture will deliver all payments, whether that's for the CP areas or the general stream. Uh, the first installments will be made in Q4 2023 with the second installment then in, in spring 2024. So that's typical of what we've already been doing in uh, loss at present. Payments for the MPIs and landscape actions will, will likely issue at regular interviews, intervals throughout the year, depending on when the actions are actually delivered on the ground. And we're also looking at the provision of a front loading of the, I suppose, that MPI and landscape action budget in terms of the three and a half thousand that we acknowledge that some farmers may have a lot of work to do maybe in year one or two, and we need to provide opportunity that they can do that up front rather than being capped to the ceiling completely of uh, three and a half thousand. 
We've got about two minutes left, John. Okay, I'm just there, Mark. Um, acres and organics. Again, I'll just leave that there. Again, organics is a tier one status in terms of if you're registered with an approved, one of the approved control bodies. Um, so again, that helps. There is a suite of actions that you can select in acres that help to sort of optimize your payments. But the key thing is on the area-based actions, we have to ensure that we're providing double funding situations. So um, organic farm payments will be reduced if there's some of the actions where that is. But again, that's clearly specified within the individual action itself. And applicants who have commonage have to undertake uh, the mandatory commonage action, even if they're doing the organics. So that's, again, trying to illustrate that mandatory commonage part. Um, slide here again the, be there for later but these are the key contacts for the hcp zones and then lastly uh, the department of agriculture contacts in terms of detail but again the key point of contact for any farmer is through the farm advisory system in terms of contacting your local farm advisor to try and look at the actions that are there and suitable for the farm and i guess the one thing we're hearing is like there's 31 actions in the general scheme so there is something for everyone in terms of trying to suit your your own farm situation in terms of you know whatever type of farm there's something there for everyone to try and take on um i think that's it from me then thank you that's great john thanks and um, thanks for keeping on time because it, it does mean we have uh plenty of time for questions and answers now um so john if you could just maybe just stop sharing your screen for us um and uh thanks to everybody who's sent in questions so far we do have uh, a lot of people are joining us this morning so uh, if you are submitting a question please try and keep it brief and i'll ask uh, and mark uh, pat to join us and and also maybe if i could ask uh john and colleagues to, to keep your responses as concise as possible so that we can get through as many of the questions as, as possible um just before we go on john um i mean we we didn't get too too stuck into the the overall objectives of the scheme but maybe just for i think it's worth for a moment just if i could ask you if we're we're, if we're, if we're meeting on this webinar uh if we're all still here in 2027 looking back at the the scheme um what what in your mind is a picture of success of the scheme over the next number of years if we're looking back on, on on how the scheme has been delivered yeah well i suppose like the changes it, yeah, a key target again, and the commission was putting a lot of pressure on this, is to try and, I guess, deliver more for the environmental regulations that are out there in terms of the water framework directive. You know, so again, we've tried to build a lot on the data layers that are there from the water framework directive for identifying high status water bodies, vulnerable water bodies, and what you can do to de deliver the right action in the right place. You know, the, the farm sustainability plan system helps to try and provide that information to farm advisors to utilize it, that it's there in a user-friendly manner to try and do that. On the biodiversity, we're targeting maybe to have 30% of, uh, I guess, the PAF, the at-risk um, sites across the country, returned or in a level of improving status. You know, so some people might say that 30% isn't good enough considering the state of biodiversity in the country, but we have to start somewhere. I guess in relation to biodiversity too, we're hoping that the results-based payment system embeds with farm advisors. You know, the feedback to date has been good on that. Again, it's to get the trust and buy-in of farmers as well into that system of that quality-based scoring system of how it how it works. You know, there's a lot in that to take on and for farmers to fully understand it and that move away from prescription to advisory in terms of what's there, trying to give that flexibility back to farmers on the ground. And then in relation to climate action, we have a number of actions there that are trying to, I guess, acres overall is trying to be part of the cap ambitions of reducing greenhouse gas emissions from agriculture. But specifically then in acres, we have uh, the low input peak grassland, which is trying to sort of get that reduced management intensity on peat soils that are under agricultural land use to try and reduce those emissions. CP areas will be looking at that peatland management as well. But it's all trying to still maintain that active, viable, vibrant farming community and the role that farmers play to actively achieve these conservation objectives. And I think we want to try and make sure that we maintain that broad role, that it's not just seeing we're trying to close down farming, but it's trying to get the right balance in that space. 
Hey, John, we're going to go straight to questions now because I'm conscious time is ticking and we have over 50 questions have come in already. So, um, Catherine, I might uh, ask you if you could uh, you know, start walk us through some of those questions and I, I'll, I'll help out as well because yeah. uh, conscious there are a lot coming through there. Yep. Um, comment for our question for Pat first about the grey partridge measures, the actions that might apply to the grey partridge. It's not a specific action mentioned this time. Yeah, so I suppose in acres we've moved away from the species specific actions, but we have a number of general actions that when chosen in combination with each other will would benefit the grey partridge. And the two important actions for grey partridge would be the grassland margin arable and the winter bird food strip. So a farmer can select both of those actions side by side, and that is compatible for the grey partridge and very similar to the grey partridge action that was there in glass. Brilliant. Um, Mark, can farmers apply for acres on ag food? We can't quite hear you there, Mark. Uh, your microphone maybe switched off. Or maybe, yeah. Can you get me now? You hear me now? Yes. Yeah. Farm, yeah. Farm yeah. Yeah. Okay. So I suppose it's important to point out there that um, all uh, applications, Catherine, come through advisors. Uh, it, it's not directly from the farmer. So we have trained a number of advisors. John mentioned that there, and we have 630 advisors now that have access to our systems. Within the next week or so, that number is going to rise significantly. And we'll, we have published a list on our website of Acres Trained Advisors. Um, so, you know, it's there. It's uh, gov.ie slash acres. That, that list is there. OK, so, yeah, farmers don't apply directly. Um, uh, John Muldowney, maybe a, a comment about beehives, please, not in the scheme. Yeah, again, Catherine, this has been one of the key changes, I guess, moving from GLOSS, that GLOSS had a number of very species specific targets around the number of bir specific birds and again, the bees, and we've tended to try and, they were low uptake actions in GLOSS. So well, again, trying to- Sorry, John, I think it was the honeybee hives, I think. It, the question was relating to, so I suppose that's a slightly different angle, isn't it? Okay. Honeybees, you know, are not necessarily maybe. Yeah, well, like, yeah. again, we have a broad suite of actions. We don't have something specifically for those, but I, I do believe the horticulture division have something on apiculture, which is completely separate to us now, but I don't have the details of that, but we yeah. can follow up separately to direct them towards what's in apiculture. Super, maybe back to Pat. Small streams on my farm, will they qualify for riparian zone measures? Yeah, so we don't distinguish between the size of, of water courses. So if, if there is a small stream, they will be eligible to, to put a, a riparian alongside that small stream. Um, any consideration given for rewarding farmers for carbon dioxide sequestration? At this point in time, no, we don't have anything specific on that. But like I understand the department, you know, this is an area that's been explored through climate policy work that's ongoing. Um, in an SAC block, you can choose two hectares of a riparian zone. What other measures can you choose on the remaining hectares in the SAC block? Yeah, well, first of all, the riparian buffer grassland actions would, would are not allowed on an SAC parcel because there's a mandatory fencing requirement for those actions. And fencing would be a, an activity that would require prior consent before you could carry it out. So that action is blocked under, on the SAC or natural layers. But in, in general, for any actions in a parcel, you can split the parcel and do a combination of, of actions. There are certain rules about actions you can do in the exact same area but you are allowed to split a parcel and do multiple actions. OK, um, I've just got my herd number this year, so I don't have a BPS 2021 application. Um, can I be considered under the scheme? Well, yeah, again, it's important. The reference here for Acres Tranche 1 is 2021. So in, in that particular case, they may need to look into preparation for Tranche 2. Uh, they'll have a BPS, assumably, uh, this year, 2022. So that will become the reference year for tranche two. So I suppose for them, you know, it might be no harm to look at what's there and what's available in the specs and so on and prepare themselves. But the actual application will have to wait. Um, 
a, a, an opinion that the cooperation zone is incorrect. Um, and but I suppose the main question is, can it be changed now? Yeah, no, unfortunately, like the, we have the systems in place at the moment on the basis of the data layers that are there. These were selected, it was across interdepartmental working group in terms of working on this. And the tenders that were put out for the CP teams were on the basis of those. So unfortunately, we can't change at this point in time. But, but I suppose, John, it's fair to say that you would hope the farmer w wouldn't be disadvantaged by being, you know, in or out. It, it yeah, should, well, like, be, yeah, if they have designated going. land, like we know that the CP areas probably have maybe 60% of the high status Natura type lands, but that means that there's 40% of Natura type lands outside of the CPs in the general stream and they are tier one. So if they have those layers, they won't be disadvantaged. Okay. And when you mentioned the tiers there, there was a question about tier two. Um, have I a chance of getting in? Again, I think that question might, um, tier two, well, sorry, tranche one includes tier one, tier two, and tier three. So I think the question was, should I wait till next year? No, if you have a tier two possibility, you can look at tier, sorry, tranche one and uh, pitch your application this year. You might as well be in. Yeah. Yeah, but no, no, no guarantees, and that, that's oh, there's no guarantees. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, of course. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, when are the completed terms and conditions available, including the ranking system for CP applicants? We have the other one. Yeah, we, we've published draft terms and conditions. They're on our website from yesterday. Now we don't expect significant differences between what's published there and what will be published within the next week or so. At the application stage terms and conditions will be available and there will be a requirement that the advisor signs off on those terms and conditions on behalf of their farmer client. But at the moment, uh, it's worth taking a look at what's there on the site and you know the substantial information is there. Can you confirm that lig parcels don't require fencing? That was, yeah, uh, I think that it relates to the water courses. Yes, yeah, so, yes, so, sorry, yeah. like fencing of water courses, thanks, yeah. Yeah, so there's no mandatory fencing if you select league, but the, any damage to watercourse will be assessed in the scorecard. So it's results based. So the, there's no prescription that you must do something or you mustn't, but you will be rewarded by what you deliver in the parcel. Where do the islands fit in? Is there any extra? Well, the, a number of the islands are part of the CP zone. So the majority of farmers who have land on the islands will be in the cooperation element of the scheme. Yes. Um, a concern about coppicing and um, being as it's so drastic, even though it can be good, um, both the length of it and, uh, you know, that it'll be down in the right place. Just any comment on that? Yeah, well, I suppose all advisors have been trained. So we give a, a day and a half of training to all advisors for them to be eligible to send in an application. So I suppose they're professionals and they will be the the people that are selecting the hedgerows that are suitable for coppicing. So we're, I suppose yeah. it is down to the advisor and the farmer to, to select the appropriate hedges. Um, you mentioned there'll be more advisors I am available uh, from the 6.30. Uh, any question there from advisors about how soon may they be all up on the system, Mark? Yeah, I mean, our last advisor training session in Atlone, um, there's a number of those yet to be added to the system. Um, they, they'll be, we, we added a new list this week that brings it up to the 6.30 within the next week, that, that figure will increase again. But I think it's important for advisors to ensure that they have done certain, um, that they have contacted acres and, and registered their interest um, not all advisors have done that. So if you haven't registered your interest in acres, um, there are advisors who attended the training but still haven't actually registered their interest and, and that's a key requirement. Uh, and we, to, do, to, do, to do that, that's really through our email, acres at agriculture.gov.ie. Mark, I might go to you in a minute, but just let one find one find one for me. Will the Department of Agriculture inspectors be doing inspections or will it be the CP teams in, in the acres CP? Yeah, so it's the Department of Agriculture are the competent authority for carrying out inspections. So the, the CP teams, they may be doing quality checks or verification checks, but it's only the department officials will be do, carrying out inspections. And actually, you know, there's sorry, an easy one there. Um, who's, who scores the private owned CP? 
It's a, the advisors. So yeah. the farm advisors will score the privately owned land. And following on from that, who scores the commonage both inside and outside the CP? So the CP teams will be scoring the commonage within the CP. And we're still um, finalizing exactly who will score the commonage outside the CP. But we see it. We don't see it at present being the advisors. We see it being the CP teams or, or some, someone similar. Um, Mark, do you want to take over with a few, look through a few and I'll go through more? Yeah, maybe just, I suppose, for, I'm, I'm looking at tr tranches and tiers and uh, I know some people do get confused about that mm. and uh, you can understand that. But uh, there's a question here from a farmer, um, or, or I'm not sure if it's a farmer, but if a farmer does, doesn't get into tranche one um, this year, uh, can the application roll over automatically for tranche two, similar to TAMS? Well, the application won't. It's a separate application process for tranche two. And once we're complete the tranche one, we'll review the scheme. And there is a possibility of some minor changes uh, in, in tranche two. But really, the, the, the application has to be made separate for tranche two. OK, but I uh, guess maybe just add the 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 plan that was in tranche one will remain on the system yeah. to apply whatever amendments might be necessary. Absolutely, so yeah. It's so interesting. It's just, yeah. It'll be just a case of updating that for, yeah. or or indeed not, maybe not making any changes at all, uh, just to yeah. resubmitting that um, next year. Um, okay. Uh, question here uh, from a farmer, a tillage farmer, with wondering if he sows a cover crop specific for bird cover for the local gun club. Does this qualify for the bird cover element in acres? So the, the species that are eligible for the winter bird food are set out in the specifications. So if they fit in with that, within the species that are listed in the specifications, it's eligible. And if they don't, then they won't. Okay. If a farmer has peat soils, will it be mandatory that they enter that plot as the low, uh, sorry, low input uh, peat grassland? No, it's not mandatory. The only mandatory action in the acres general scheme is commonage. So all other actions are voluntary. Okay, if a farmer has a high water, and thanks for <laughs> the concise responses, we're, we're, we're getting through them here. Um, if a farmer has high water status on their farm with uh, PIP, P, critical source area, uh, P focused, and uh, okay, this is, uh, do they have to choose it? Um, so I'm not really sure what that is. Yeah, so if you have land in high status water catchment in the general scheme, mm -hmm. you have the potential to get tier one if you pick from a list of, of appropriate actions, but it's a voluntary uptake of that action. So if you pick the right action in the, that's addressing water, in the area that's in the high water catchment, you, you've the possibility of getting tier one access to the scheme. Okay. Uh, Catherine, you might yeah. uh, have an answer for the next one there in relation to the costs uh, involved in the specific actions. And, and do we have any idea of the application costs uh, for um, somebody who wants to get their plan done by Chagask? Uh, we do, Mark, and I just, there's a range, there's, there's a range of, of, of uh, farm sizes and then whether it is, uh, whether it involves a, a farm visit or not, or in, in the CP area, some of the applications are straightforward. So um, I, I just can't, yeah, it's best I to talk, talk, talk to your expected, individual yeah, advisor about that. I don't that. want to say the wrong one. And just on that one, can I just ask Pat to confirm there, the biggest query we're getting at the moment is the, and John spoke about the actions that the farmer in the CP area can make up uh, to, to make up their money. But can I just confirm that where the advisor is involved in generating those additional actions, that that's next year's work. It'll just help advisors at the moment. Yeah, so I suppose other than the stone walls at the moment. Yeah, so does the distinction, I suppose, a general a general action is something that's in the specification for that are available to the acres general applicants. CP applicants also can avail of those general actions. Okay, but money is ring fenced for the for the commonage and CP forage lands. So depending on the amount of land you have within the CP area or commonage will depend on whether you'll get paid for general actions. But if there is money available for general actions, they have to be chosen this year. 
when you're submitting your application. That's for those with the budget left over for them. Exactly. Yeah. But so if you're trying to make up, yeah, the third group then. So, yeah. So, so the other element then is non productive investments and landscape actions. Okay. So, they are actions that are one off applications. Yeah. So, you apply them, you could choose to apply them for one year or not. You can, if you don't apply from one year, you can apply from the following year. So, they're, they're equivalent to what a general action might be or they might look like, but it's a one year commitment and it's a one year payment. And you will get the opportunity to apply for them after your land is scored next summer. Yeah, pretty much. Question here from a, a very busy advisor up in Donegal, uh, wondering if there's any indication if tier two and three applications will be successful in 2022. Any point in submitting tier three plans, um, given the, the, the level of interest, likely interest? Yeah, I, well, I suppose we can't predict how many applications will come in and how many will be tier one or tier two. Um, you're, you've a, l a lot less chance of your tier three, I would imagine, in tranche one. There will be, I, we think there's going to be very high demand in tranche one. So we're not saying don't submit an application. That's up to, to each individual, but it, it is probably unlikely but we can say for definite a tier three application will be successful in tranche one. And I'm not sure, John, if you confirmed in your presentation that the riparian buffer zone is remaining at two hectares, isn't it? Yes. It's yeah. remaining okay. At two um, be... And again, about large areas designated in geese and swans, but again, Pat, you're after saying there, nothing is mandatory. It's all about getting your chances up. Okay. Exactly. And, and putting the, rec the, the right action in the right place, obviously, but the, the maps are a guide, isn't that right? They're a guide to the advisor to help us put the right action in the right place. Exactly, yeah. So there is a huge amount of maps available to advisors on our acres mapping system. And, you know, they can choose to turn off or turn on those layers and that will guide them to where the right action should go. And again, can I just come back to the, the I was wondering, had I missed it there, but a query question has come in about the, the uh, ranking and selection for acres CP isn't available yet, just to confirm that it isn't, is that right? Yeah, so it's not included in the drafts terms and conditions that were put up yesterday evening, but it will be available next week. Okay. When when the final version of the terms and conditions is available, it's just it requires uh, a slight tweak, and so it's just slightly delayed. There's okay. still lots of questions coming in around the um, you know access to glam, but the advice is if if you're having problems, I think email acres at agriculture.gov.ie is that, that I think the... I think that's about the best and I suppose we, we are getting a number of queries and we are getting to everybody so if you do have that but in your response you know in your query if you can give us specific details your AGT number your AGY number those codes will, will help us look up your where you are on the system um, and, and we will get to everybody. Mark, we're not going to get to all the questions I'm undertaking to, 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 to take note of all of them and uh, look after them and get them get answers to them. And just one, one, one important one, maybe, does the farmer carry a risk of having to pay an advisor and the plan may not go through? I think that depends on the arrangement between the farmer and the advisor of when. Yeah. Payments. You know, like there's different local arrangements, I think, in terms of when those services are paid for. Okay. Um, okay look we're, we're just over time unfortunately um, and we do have a lot more questions so we have these questions recorded on the system we will download them and uh, see if we can go through them uh, but obviously huge level of interest in the scheme so um, look I want to thank you John uh, Mark and Pat for joining us this morning and being so generous with your time um, we have uh, that, that session coming up on Tuesday with advisors so uh, if there's more specific questions to be asked by advisors they can they can attend that webinar and I presume they'll, they, they're getting details of that um, so thanks again Catherine for for helping out with the questions and um, I just want to bring your attention to uh, our uh, webinar next week uh, we're going to be kicking off uh, sustainability week farming for a better future and so we're working with our colleagues in the signpost team to deliver a live um, broadcast from the new Chagas studio in Oak Park in Carlow and uh, I can promise you we have a very 
interesting and uh, different uh, signpost webinar for you next Friday. So we do hope you can join us for that on the 14th, uh, where we'll be hearing from um, uh, some of our, our researchers. And also we'll be doing a live link out on farm. Um, uh, we'll be talking about uh, reducing nitrogen on farms. Uh, so so do I hope you can join us for that. Um, and I would just want to say a final thanks to Yvonne Maher and Andy Boland and Pat Mur Murphy uh, in the background who are uh, doing a lot of the work in preparation for, for all of these uh, webinars. So until next Friday, uh, thanks for watching and have a good weekend. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.